7. Involvement in Sufi study When we talk about the possibilities of involvement in Sufi activity, we must have a very clear idea that the possibilities are inextricably linked with the desires of the person involved. If you are looking for something to make you feel better, or to make you feel significant, or to assuage your need for togetherness, you will look for something which offers these things. But you will not be involved with Sufis or in the Sufi activity. And you will have forgotten that there is a perfectly good American phrase saying, there is no such thing as a free lunch. It is here in the West that one would very much like to understand how things have deteriorated and would like to prove the inaccuracy of the now famous jibe Spirituality was born in the Near East, developed in Central Asia, grew old in Iran, went mad in Europe, and travelled to America to die. In matters like these, although far from a purist, I am a supporter of the French proverb, there is no such thing as a fairly good omelette. Let us recapitulate how the Sufis do see their activity. What most people call Sufism is traditionally known in the East as being a Sufi or the Sufia, and the ism part is very typically a Western concept. If we speak of Sufism, it is only for ease of communication. In a similar way, a citizen of Wales will call himself Welsh, even though this is an old English word meaning foreigner. Its purpose is to enable us to understand what lies behind ordinary limitations of perception. This is referred to both as experiencing reality and as realising one's potential. These studies, involving the capacity of encountering what is beyond humanity, are quite distinct from the inculcation of an ideology or training in and eliciting habitual responses. When we talk of this enterprise as a psychology, we must remember that it covers areas far beyond the usual meanings assigned to this term at the present time in the West. The Path The Sufi system is pursued by the organisation of groups of people, linked to a central direction to form a community which is based on principles and realities beyond the herd instinct or the pleasures obtained through belonging to something. This enterprise is called the Tariqa, the path. Far from being characterised by constant activity and perpetual teaching, it is just as concerned with such recondite statements as to be neglected by a man of wisdom is better than to gain the total attention of a fool. The Tariqa embodies action and inaction, learning and teaching, in a rhythm which concentrates and stabilises it into an institution with the necessary flexibility and sophistication. Its action has been referred to as being by means of baraka, a subtle communications and enrichment element. In deteriorated, folkloric and lower level thinking, this substance, as it has been termed, has been imagined to be something in the nature of magical power. In quasi-scientific thought, it is sometimes conceived as a force with special characteristics like, say, magnetism. Such characteristics, for the Sufi, succeed only in illustrating the limitations of both kinds of formulation, not in defining this element at all. In reality, it is only understood by most people through their misunderstanding, their distortion of it. The Western Seeker we can conveniently remember in this connection the tale of the man who heard a word and assumed it meant something, and after that was able to understand, as he thought, another statement which contained the word, but which did not mean that at all. In Kabul, Afghanistan, they tell a story of a foreign seeker after truth. As soon as he got down from his aeroplane, he asked an engineer in a foreign language, Who is the greatest Sufi teacher? The man, not understanding, said, Nami Farmam, which means, I don't understand you. But of course, the visitor thought that this was the name of the great man whom he was seeking. Shortly afterwards, he saw a crowd watching a funeral procession. 
who is being buried? he asked a bystander. Nami Fama, said the man, I don't understand you. To think that I arrived too late to see him, cried the seeker, and returned sorrowfully to his own country. Now this man tells anyone who will listen of his great pilgrimage and its poignant end. Do the ignorant understand the wise? The essence of the Sufi operation's success is to give rather than to want to get, to serve rather than to be served. Although almost all cultures pay lip service to this as an ideal, the failure really to operate it means that the mental, the psychological posture which unlocks the greater capacity of the consciousness is not achieved where this element is lacking, and so people do not learn. You can't cheat in this game. It is often considered a paradox, especially by people who want to get something and to rationalise their greed as, at least, laudable ambition, that when the ambition is suspended anything can be gained. The easiest way of dealing with this is to affirm, with relative truth, that since people customarily want too much, the non-ambitious posture is a corrective, which enables them to be just ambitious enough and not too greedy focusing their mentation to operate correctly in this respect. Sufi mentors are only too well aware of the underlying greed and how and why it must be assuaged. The wise, it is said, understand the ignorant, for they were themselves once ignorant. But the ignorant do not understand either themselves or the wise, never having been wise themselves. This is certainly true in the matter of due and correct measure, in Sufi matters. Two kinds of Sufi group Among the legitimate Sufis, those with an intact tradition, there are two kinds of study groups where the basic work is done. These are 1. Associations of people trying to find out if they can form, maintain and stabilise a group with potential. These are usually known as dervish groups. Among the tests are whether the group will deteriorate into a power system or a hierarchical setup, whether the activities of the group will degenerate into a mere search for personal satisfactions, since social satisfactions can, of course, be obtained anywhere else, or whether some other kind of immature demand will develop. Very many such groups are not successful, since their members, by a sort of unsensed conspiracy, seldom recognise how easily subjective demands can take over and under how deep a disguise they may operate. Many of the collections of spiritual people which one sees in the West, and not a few in the East, are really this kind of group. Stabilised they may be, spiritual activities they are not. 2. Sufic groups, called taifas are either established by a teacher or accepted by him or her from among individuals or members of the first type of group, supposing that they have avoided the preliminary pitfalls. They often have a keynote or outward function, as well as an inner and developmental one. This may mean that their members could be engaged in art, social action, human service, even commerce, as well as carrying out their appropriate exercises and studies. The purpose of these outward activities includes testing whether the people can work successfully in an organic whole without a. subjective considerations ruining their operation, or b. the outward activity being taken over and being spiritualized by people imagining that, say, social service is sacred instead of a minimum duty. In both Eastern and Western communities, it is not rare to find the derivatives of such groups where one or the other activities has gained the ascendancy. Groups which concentrate only upon spiritual exercises, concentration, contemplation or meditation are, diagnostically, this kind of deteriorated group. The exercises have become the commerce of the group and its social expression. Secondary materials, including artworks, poetry, literature and artefacts, have traditionally, though not uniquely, originated from such groups. This reputable origin has had the further complicating effect 
of causing well-meaning imitators, often very pious but essentially superficial ones, to examine and attach themselves to the secondary materials, with correspondingly poor results in terms of real understanding, though not necessarily in personal satisfactions. When this happens, it is either the greed industry at work, or the group being used for psychotherapeutic or social stability purposes. If you are one of the people who want to eat their cake and have it, you would qualify for this phase of such a group. Someone was telling me the other day that his opinion was that one of the great triumphs of Western man had been to divert human greed into a thirst for knowledge, in a sufficient number of cases to make education and human progress a major achievement. This may look, at first glance, like a great thought, but if you want to believe this, you must close your eyes to research done centuries ago, which determined that you can only learn a few things by such a method, and that when you get to a blind alley through trying this approach, you may find yourself asking people who have done the research what went wrong with your program. Greed and Aspiration how do you transform, say, human greed into a laudable motivation for progress? Quite obviously you can channel a certain amount of energy into constructive places only when you know what you are dealing with and how to deal with it. The solution which has, as anyone can see, usually been attempted, is to reiterate constantly, don't be greedy, be constructive. Anyone can see how this puts at a premium the ability to conceal greed under a constructive-looking facade. Instead of assuming that greed is normality, one should see it as an abnormality. Beside it lies normality, trying to find expression. So all human groups, unless carefully monitored, are subject to spiritual deterioration when the objective is obscured and finally eliminated through the overdevelopment of easier-to-follow activities like prayer or discipline and so on. People talk almost endlessly, it sometimes seems to me, about learning wisdom from experience. Among the Sufis, however, people learn from experience how to recognize wisdom. Experience is useless unless there is a means to digest it. The great variety of esoteric groups with differing outward appearances is a result, according to Sufi assessment, of only two factors. The first is that temporary teaching frames suited to a specific community have later been adopted as sacrosanct. The second is that the secondary activities have become oversimplified into supposed essentials. Doctrinal differences do not exist in Sufi understanding since all perceptions of truth are the same. Hence, such differences belong to the level of ideologically based, not experience-tested, systems. Ideologies exist only where there is no absolute knowledge. If you know something, you do not have to believe or disbelieve it. Ideology is associated with automatism, doctrine in the Sufi sense with the instrumental. It is both natural and hazardous to confuse current preoccupations, or even perennial questions, with eternal truths. Truth is what you can learn, not what you think you must learn. It is what is there, not what you want to be there. March towards a landmark by all means, the Sufi says, there is often no other way of keeping to the shortest route. But when you do this, you must also know that this is an activity to a purpose. The landmark and perhaps the habit of marching must be thrown aside when it has served its purpose. Those who can understand this and live with it can become Sufis. Even if I wanted to do so, I could not forget how grotesque things can become in this area. I have seen it so often, but I will tell you the most advanced case of it I know for illustrative purposes. The Balanced Egg I was challenged by a reverend member of a certain spiritual community to balance an egg on the tip of my nose. This, I was told, had been successfully done by a former head of their teaching, and not very long ago at that. Since I couldn't do it, I was regarded, 
though temporarily, I am glad to report, by the others present as spiritually inadequate. This impression was not dispelled, to put it no higher, by my devout challenger. The spell was broken by a dissident in the group, the equivalent to the child in the crowd, who said, This seems to me heroic but hazardous, and elegant but essentially materialistic, to say nothing of the danger I sense in such activities, of falling a victim to the sin of pride. In conversation later with a prominent but retired leader of this community, I asked him how the egg trick had started. It was originally devised, he told me, for television. The true group, the kind known as organic, is developed, indeed comes into being, in response to the potentialities of a situation. Of course, it is not always possible to convey these facts to everyone, however much people say, tell it like it is. You have to temporise, generally because people cannot take all this in at one gulp, especially if they have come to hear something else, such as that they can obtain something they don't know about by methods that have never worked. Come back in three years. One day, when I was very young, I was sitting in the company of a renowned Sufi master. A traveller had come in, having journeyed for many months to see our Sufi. I have come because I am sure that I must ask you now to accept me as a pupil, he said. The Sufi answered, Come back in three years and have no contact with me in the meantime. As the visitor withdrew, I gasped at the length of time given and the hardship of the prescription. Yes, I know, said the Sufi. I should have said ten years, but I did not want him to think that I was harsh. It would do him no good to have something against me. Importance of the Organisation Since the manifestation of the higher human perception and its stabilisation are so relatively difficult in social and professional environments which constantly drive people toward exaggerated ambition, fear, display, habit, and so on. The maintenance and integrity of the instrument is of the utmost importance. This, the Tarika, is therefore regarded as the real home, and the school and source of stimulus and protector of the student in matters of Sufi studies. In decayed systems, as we have seen, the container is mistaken for the content, and organisation worship, traditionally termed by Sufis idolatry, supervenes. The degree of realisation of the individual and of the group depend upon the harmony of the knowledge introduced by the direction, with the protection of the individual from extremes on the one hand, and his own sincerity and preparedness to align himself with truth, not bias or dogma or the craving for instant or ready satisfactions, on the other. The degree of potentiality depends on the correctness of one's aspiration. Similarity of this approach to other formulations Attention to the above points will show that they are close to the requirements of some very much more familiar teaching situations. No vocational enterprise, for instance, could operate without a source of teaching, suitable students grouped in the appropriate place at the right time, a minimum of essential information and certain conduct, and the avoidance of distractions and irrelevancies. Certain kinds of effort are also necessary to the attainment of any objective. In both the East and West, as we have noted, people are accustomed to numerous organisations through which their aspirations may find expression and, it is hoped, fulfilment. The Sufi institution of the Tariqa is such an instrument, but it is not going too far to say that the attraction of esoteric studies, for many people, lies exactly in the lack of order and purpose in vestigial and other forms. The Sufis, in common with people in all other purposeful undertakings, maintain their own frameworks and organisations. This is one reason why Sufic activity is said to have no history. 
not being hysteriocentric, Sufic attention regards history, personality, esoteric tourism, and museum keeping activities as ancillary at best, but not ever as central. The Sufi's relevance and effectiveness is constantly refreshed from its source, through the Sufi organism, not by reference to static lumps of doctrine or frozen ritual. Counterfeit gold, as Rumi said, is made only because there is such a thing as real gold for people to try to imitate. Other Higher Consciousness Groupings The exponents of Sufi study do not ordinarily pronounce upon matters such as the genuineness or otherwise of specific individuals, cults or schools. Like any other legitimate teaching body, they are responsible to state their principles and to maintain the integrity and progress of the activity in which they are engaged. This does not imply competing with bodies which prefer to operate on different bases. Enquirers, however, should be able to assess such other entities as they encounter, should they wish to do so, by reference to the schemata of the correct Sufi tradition, openly available, and by the application of common sense. A dog and a cat may fight to decide which one of them is a rat. A Sufi is more concerned with the truth. Random Adoption of Teachings the fact that some Sufi and other teaching material is available in general circulation books has produced two effects. One, some people familiarise themselves with the material and then approach legitimate Sufi sources if they wish to enter into comprehensive studies. This is, of course, one purpose of the publications mentioned. Two, others, who are probably in the majority, but whose efforts are insubstantial, attempt to employ the materials to teach themselves or others, while lacking the essential experiences upon which alone such teaching functions can be productively sustained. Their enthusiasm or ambition outruns their preparedness to learn correctly. We have noted the consequences, and you can see them everywhere. The parallel with more familiar learning systems can usefully be invoked again here. The random adopters may be said to be doing themselves and others as much good as people who know nothing about medical science would if they were to read a few books and buy a few medicaments. Truth seeks you totally. Make sure that you really seek it. Pattern of the Sufi Enterprise The Sufi Enterprise is carried out in the following pattern. 1. Materials are circulated from a source of knowledge. 2. Individuals and groups familiarise themselves with this material. 3. Those who seek instant satisfactions, attractive theory and so on are discouraged. 4. People needing comprehensive study enter into it. 5. Outward and inward activities in individuals and groupings are organised. These are based on assessed needs and possibilities. 6. The appearance of the effort may or may not have a visible affinity with a superseded framework, however attractive. 7. Individuals and groupings are harmonised by a programme of interaction between them and the guiding element, also referred to in some aspects as a central direction. During this process, Conditions are established and maintained for genuine Sufic activity, which involves including the necessary nutrients and avoiding limiting factors. 8. Those people and groupings which have preferences for other kinds of association are given early and adequate opportunities to appreciate that their requirements have to be fulfilled elsewhere, to the contentment of all. Each will then be able to follow a path consistent with his or her true current aim and capacity. As a psychology, one Sufi procedure can be isolated to make sense of people and situations which, if one adopts customary methods, remain susceptible to analysis. Ordinary human assessment is generally based upon looking for outstanding characteristics in people and labelling them with this as their behaviour pattern. It is more than just interesting, however, 
to observe that these assumed outstanding characteristics reflect what the person is like. They do, in fact, reflect certain results of learnt behaviour. Many years ago, a Sufi sage advised me to look at the behaviour of people, shall we say including tolerance, indifference, hostility and the rest, and then to disregard these and look for even more, less well-defined behaviours. I was amazed, when I developed the knack for doing this, to discover whole new and unfamiliar ranges of purposeful behaviour in people, signalling parts of the total behaviour, which enabled me to make sense of the whole in a way which isolating only the crude and socially conditioned expressions of behaviour did not. This is, of course, an advanced way of what we all term not being distracted by appearances or not generalising from too little material. Transformed into an observation technique, it becomes a truly remarkable assessment tool. But I will end with a phrase which my first teacher used to say, and from which I learnt more than from anything else which I can register, from the voluminous and ancient lore of the Sufis, and which is a key, if there ever was one, to the method of understanding this astonishingly rich wisdom. He is a master who may teach without it being totally labelled teaching. He is a student who can learn without being obsessed by learning. <laughs>